Well, good morning. Good morning. All right. So my name is Andy Newberry, and I'm really excited to get to be here and to share this message with you. Um, I also want to be mindful to keep the Pastor Carlson and his family in prayer, uh, the Agrestes, keeping them in prayer. Um, and yeah, so uh, as far as who am I, like who is this guy getting up here preaching? Uh, I am a part of the teaching and preaching ministry of Park Church a few times a year. I'll also actually preach and not just do things behind the scenes. Uh, but I'm excited to get to, to share this today as we've been thinking through in this season of Advent about times of waiting, times of longing for things. And as in preparing for this, I thought there was this time some years ago, I was driving home from a friend's house, not too far away, like maybe like 15, 20 miles away from where I lived. And part of that included a, you know, 10 minute drive on the parkway. And it was around this time of year, maybe a little bit later. But as I'm driving home, you know, it's a lovely evening and then there's a very pleasant snowfall coming down. And I'm like, oh, what a beautiful drive. And then the snow keeps coming down a little harder and a little harder. My fingers are clutching the wheel a little more. And then it is just a whiteout blizzard. And I'm on the parkway going about five miles an hour, like a crazy old man. <laughs> what am I doing? And it was terrifying because to not be able to see while you're in a vehicle is awful, but also to realize as I'm doing the calculations here, okay, I can't stop because someone's gonna rear end me. I have to keep going, but I don't really know where I'm going. So what are my options? And so, you know, other than sweating like crazy and clutching the steering wheel. So as I keep driving, I am watching my GPS. I'm watching the, the tail lights of the cars in front of me, and I'm keeping track of my odometer thinking, where am I in the parkway? Because this is a, a drive that I had done thousands and thousands of times. I know this road, but I can't see it at all. So I am mostly just following the taillights in front of me, and they're following the taillights in front of them, and then I'm watching my GPS thinking, this should be like just a five minute ride. I just had a few miles to go until I get to my exit, but I just had to keep going. I couldn't see. It was scary. And as I go, and it's, I can't see, I can just barely see those taillights in front of me, I see my GPS, hey, this is my exit. And I'm looking, I can't see the exit. I can't, I could see a few cars maybe heading that way. And I realized, I've got to turn. <laughs> um, because I just wanted to get off this road. And I thought at least, yeah, if I can get off of this exit, I can pull over somewhere, maybe there's safety. But there was also a strange safety and comfort of, well, at least I can see the taillights of the cars in front of me. That would have been so comfortable. Just even though that's not where I wanted to go, I just wanted to follow those lights. But my GPS told me this is where I should go. My odometer was telling me this is my exit. I knew where to go. It just, I couldn't see. So I, I start pulling over and I'm looking and looking, pulling over. And finally I get over to the exit. And I get to the exit and I'm pulling onto the exit, to exit 105, like right, right by here. Uh, and I'm slowly coming around the ramp and I'm like, oh, this is where it's gonna get really ugly because the road is turning and I really have to rely on my GPS. And then the snow stopped, completely clear. Boom, smooth sailing. I get home five minutes later. I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> and it, there are just moments in life when we think we know where we're going. We're on autopilot. We're going through life and everything's fine. And then the lights go out and we are in darkness. We don't know where we're going. We thought we knew where we were going, but we just can't see. And what do we want in those moments? Well, we want a light for a path. We want the wisdom to know which way should I go? And I'm sure a lot of us have had similar weird driving experiences like that. But there's other times in life as well where we find ourselves unexpectedly in a moment of darkness. In a moment where we, we thought we knew where we were going, we had a plan, but then the lights go out. Everything that we thought was clear isn't clear and we're stuck and we don't know which way to go. And we want a light for our way. We want wisdom for our way. And so uh, for me professionally, I work as a tutor, tutoring high school kids. And at this time of year, the moment of darkness my students are in, that, that thing that they just want to figure out is their college admissions. Uh, early decision, you know, those come out in the next week or so. And these students, 
they are in a panic over this. They are stressing. And for some of you adults, maybe you could think back to that time when you were in high school, or for some of the kids maybe in the room, that'll be you someday. Um, but these kids, they're, they're so worried about, okay, what college am I gonna get into? And more importantly, like, what college should I go to? Like, what is that right decision? And, and if I were to sort of summarize the inner monologue that these kids tell me they're having, it, it goes something like this. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I'm gonna find out in a week. Am I gonna get in this college? And they're wondering, did I work hard enough? Did, did I do it enough clubs? Did I do enough activities? Are, are my SAT scores good enough? Am I good enough? What am I gonna do if I don't get in? What are my parents gonna say? What are my friends gonna say? And it's this deep, moment of panic and stress because to them it feels like this moment of truth all hinging on this application of getting into college and and then even once they get in then they're panicking over you know am i going to make the right decision about getting into college and for each of us here what is that thing that you're waiting for what is that result you're waiting on that right now feels like you're just in a season of darkness waiting to figure out that next thing because maybe for some of you, you're not waiting for college results, but you're waiting for the results from your doctor. Or maybe you're waiting for a response from your boss. Or maybe you're waiting for some answer from someone who was a friend and now feels estranged. And you're waiting for those results. And you're just trying to figure out, what am I supposed to do? And you are longing for the wisdom to know what is the right way to move forward in this. If that's you, hear this. We are not alone. We are not unique in feeling like we're in a time of waiting and wanting. We are not alone in feeling like we just want to know which way we're supposed to go because we're in need of wisdom. In fact, in this Christmas series, as we've been going through this idea of waiting for it, we've been looking at the story of Israel as talked about in the prophet Isaiah. And in this uh, series, we're looking at Isaiah's beautiful promises of peace and purpose and hope that he gives to the nation of Israel at a time of deep darkness. Uh, they didn't know where they were supposed to go. They were being oppressed by the Assyrian Empire, an empire that was known for thriving by instilling fear into their enemies. Uh, if you read some of the writings of their, their kings like Sargon the Great or other people, they use words like, to describe what they do to their enemies, they use words like defleshing. That shouldn't be a word, you know? <laughs> but this, this is the existential threat that they were facing. This was a time of deep darkness. And so for them, they really were faced with a choice. Do we follow the hard path that God is revealing to us through his prophets like Isaiah? Or do we instead choose to light a fire for ourselves, to light our own way and go our own path? And so living in that uncertainty about our future can feel like living in a time of darkness. And in those seasons of darkness, when we hear promises like uh, Lynn had read for us this morning, it can be so powerful to know that God promises light in a dark time. Uh, we heard from Isaiah 42 that when God's chosen one comes, that means the Messiah, which we now know means Jesus. When he comes, he will have God's spirit on him. And listen to these words. He's going to open eyes that are blind, free captives from prison, and release from the dungeon those in darkness. Does that sound like good news? To, to have your eyes open, to, to get out of a dungeon when you're sitting in darkness. But for the Israelites, as we see a little bit later in chapter 50, that in that season of darkness, they were so strongly tempted to say, no, I want to get out of this on my own. I'm going to light my own path, light my own way. So here's what Isaiah says a little bit later to them in chapter 50. He says, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? who walks in darkness and has no light, yet trusts in the name of the Lord and relies on his God. But all of you are kindlers of fire, lighters of fire or brands. Walk in the flame of your own fire and among the brands that you have kindled. 
Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> let, let me unpack that a bit. Uh, when Old Testament writers use the phrase, the fear of the Lord, they were typically talking about having a right recognition of our relationship with God. Basically, having a fear of the Lord is this, recognizing that God is God and we are not. And that when we choose to live in the recognition that God is more just, God is more wise, God is more loving than we will ever be, then that is wise. That is walking in the fear of the Lord. And when we do that, when we recognize that God is God and we are not, then we can be free to live out our own roles rather than trying to be the God of our own little worlds. And so when we read the phrase, the fear of the Lord, this is also usually connected to wisdom. So there's a lot of Psalms and Proverbs that talk about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's because living in right relationship with God is the wise thing to do. And so when Isaiah is saying in chapter 50 that uh, here's the wise thing to do, even when we're in seasons of darkness, the wise thing to do, the fear of the Lord thing to do is to keep walking with God, even if it's a season of darkness. And that's gonna be wiser than choosing to try to light our own fires, to kindle our own way. Um, the temptation though is always for us to light a fire of our own cleverness, essentially making ourselves the God of our own little worlds when we propagate our illusions of control. And so being called to do this, it, this waiting on God in the darkness, this waiting in faith, it's hard. And like, to be honest, it's hard. I like being in control. My wife may have stronger words for that desire that I have to want to be in control. But when we're called to wait in faith, that is a hard thing to do. And when we can't see just a few feet in front of us, it's, we want to light our own path. Um, it's completely natural to become impatient and to want to take control. Um, and, and please hear me this. I'm not saying that in a season of darkness, when you can't fully see where you're going, that what you're supposed to do is just stop and do nothing. When I was on the parkway and it was dark and I couldn't see, the wise thing to do wasn't to stop. I would have been rear-ended. That would have been a, an unwise thing to do. Um, I had to patiently, carefully, alertly track my, you know, trust my instruments and keep going. Um, but there's a big difference between carefully going down the highway versus, you know, flipping on my useless high beams, gunning it and saying, I got this. Um, in those seasons of uncertainty and darkness, there is a level of trust that we have to exhibit. And that's what it is to walk by faith, even in the darkness, to seek wisdom for that way, to seek a light for our path. And so I understand the impatience that waiting can foster. It's hard. Um, waiting is hard. Uh, whenever we feel that strong sense of urgency, waiting feels passive, it feels weak, it feels like something we don't want to do. And so it's helpful just to acknowledge that. Um, so what does it mean though to then actually wait in faith? Well, let me give an illustration of what waiting in faith does not look like. So some of you know, like a million years ago, I used to be a ballroom dance instructor. Some of you don't know that, surprise. Um, so for about five years, I taught people how to foxtrot and tango, how to swing and salsa. This was a blast of a job to have in my 20s. And in, in doing this job, I got to meet a lot of interesting people, but I also learned a lot about relationships by observing the interaction of different couples. And inevitably, as I would be teaching, there would be a couple that would come in, and I mean, this weekly, this would happen. And clearly in the, you know, maybe the husband and wife that would come in, one of the two of them was the one that really wanted to be there. And, and it usually wasn't the husband. Um, and so I'd be trying to teach each of them their parts. Here's the role you do. Okay, to the gentleman, here's what you do. To the lady, here's what you do. But the lady would grow impatient with the guy as he's trying to figure out what to do. He's sweating bullets. He's counting out loud and his mouth moving. Um, but she, she instead, here's what she's doing. She is forcefully yanking backwards on this guy, compelling him to lead her around the dance floor. Now, I want you to think on that phrasing for a moment. Compelling him 
to lead her around the dance floor. This is not <laughs> what her role is supposed to be. Um, but I recognize for her, like, she's feeling impatient. She wants to get going. But this guy, he only knows two steps, and he's trying to figure out which one he's going to do. Um, but she wants to get going, and it's natural for her to feel impatient. Um, but when these couples start to learn what their parts are, the timing of the music, and how to, to make this work, it actually became a beautiful thing and something that was actually fun for both of them. And when there is a good level of trust between the partners, when each person knows what their role is and trusts the other person to do theirs, it is a beautiful and a fun experience. Waiting in faith can be hard. And I recognize that we can grow impatient and we want to essentially yank God around and say, God, I want to do this my way. I don't want to wait on your time. I'm going to light my own fire. I'm going to pull myself around the dance floor. Um, but that's not how it's supposed to work. In, in this type of dance that we have, like if you look at these ballroom dancers, when they do it well, it's amazing what these women do in their dancing. That, um, if you think about it, in, in the phrase follow, when you think the leads and follow, follow, it's kind of a misleading term to describe what the ladies part actually is. The better term is really responding because the lady's part is to respond to the lead of the gentleman. And so she has to constantly, actively be alert to whatever cues and signals that he may be sending, and she has to respond to it instantly, and she has to do it backwards and in high heels. <laughs> it is impressive. Um, so for us, as we are walking in faith, we are actively responding to the leading of God which means we need to be open to whatever signals and leading and cues that God is giving us. We need to be alert and ready to respond, but we're not meant to be the one in control. That responding to God, following God, waiting in faith, looks like being ready to respond to the leading of God. And so how do we respond to God's lead better? Well, basically there's just two tasks that we're gonna have. Uh, we have two tasks if we're going to respond to God's lead better. The first task is we just ask God for wisdom. Uh, we're going to ask God for wisdom. So we, I have a slide here from the book of James. James, by the way, he's the brother of Jesus. And so after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, um, G, uh, James becomes a huge leader in the church and in a letter to people trying to follow God. Listen to what he says here. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. What a beautiful promise any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Right now, what is the wisdom that you seek? What is it that you feel in your gut that, God, I need wisdom in this area? This is my darkness. God, what is the light to my, way, my path? What is the wisdom for my way? God says, just ask. He delights in giving this. Um, if we last, lack wisdom, let us just ask. And, and it could be that the reason why we don't have wisdom is we just haven't asked. And uh, the reason why we can ask God for this isn't because we've attained a certain level of cleverness and that God is like so pleased with our cleverness that he says, oh, let me give you a little extra wisdom. You've come so far. No, we have the right to ask for wisdom because we have a generous God who delights in giving us good gifts. Um, I also love this second description that God is not only generous, he gives to us without finding fault. And, and what this makes me think of is this contrasting view of the person who does find fault with us when we ask for things. This is actually one of my pet peeves in life. Um, do you ever have a moment where you, someone says something and you're like, oh, like, what do you mean? Like, what is that? 
And the person responds, what? You don't know what that is? And right away you're like, you know, I asked the question because I didn't know. <laughs> like, um, and this person just makes you feel small and, and foolish for asking a question. That's finding fault with someone. That drives me nuts. Like for me as a teacher, I love when students ask questions. Uh, I love when kids don't know something, they ask me, oh, what does that mean? And because my role as a teacher, it's not to judge a kid for not knowing something. If they don't know something, well, that's on me to help them to know it. Like that's, that's a teaching opportunity. That takes courage to ask something that they don't know and to, to admit that. And I love when they do that. As a teacher, it then becomes my pet peeve when other people don't do that for these kids. But we've all had teachers, though, that think differently, right? We've all had either teachers, coworkers, friends, family members who go out of their way to make us feel small when we ask for wisdom on something. And it's not hard to imagine that we take those cumulative experiences of being ridiculed for trying to learn and then translate those experiences into our relationship with God and to assume, like, I'm not going to ask God about this. this I'm going to feel foolish. No, no, li listen to this promise. God is a generous God. He gives without finding fault. If we lack wisdom, just ask. God delights in giving wisdom to his people. He is not going to find fault with you for doing this. This is his joy to do. We have a generous God. And so our first task in responding to God's leading is just to ask God for wisdom. And so then our second task is this, follow through on the wisdom that the God gives. So if we pray for wisdom, we know, God, I need wisdom, and that God answers, step two, respond to that. Like, do something with the wisdom that God has given you. Follow through on that. Uh, what does it mean to follow through? Well, part of this here, it says that when God gives you that wisdom, your job is to believe and to not doubt, because if you doubt, you're like a person, like a wave tossed about in the ocean. Don't be that. Be instead the person who follows through in the wisdom that God gives you. Uh, let me illustrate. Coming back to those students that I mentioned who are really stressing out over what college they should go through, and this happens every year. They're, they're so wrapped up in this one question. Am I going to make the right decision? Am I going to make the right decision about what college to go to? And that is all they're thinking about. If, if, and they're thinking, if I could just make that right decision, everything else in life will be taken care of. And, and they're imagining, oh, I just picked the right college, and then whew, smooth sailing from there. And I try to tell them, no, <laughs> that is not how it works. This is just one decision. You are front-loading all of the pressure on decision one. But there are a thousand and one other decisions you're going to have to make once you choose the right college. Like, will I show up to class today? <laughs> will I do my homework? Will I do all of my homework? Um, am I going to go to that late night party? Am I going to go to bed early? Am I going to get to know my professors? What kind of friends am I going to make? There are these thousand and one other decisions we have to make after that first decision. And in fact, the cumulative effect of those thousand and one other decisions they weigh so much more heavily in the overall outcome of their college experience. They're so stressed out over which college they should go to, instead of thinking about which type of college student am I going to be when I get there. Um, they're thinking that where they apply matters more than how much will they apply themselves once they get there. And so the phrase that I teach these kids, it's not just about making the decision right, or sorry, it's not just about making the right decision, it's about making the decision right. Like, it's not just about, oh, am I gonna make the right decision? It's, are you gonna make the decision right? Are you gonna follow up? Are you, how are you gonna do on those thousand and one other decisions after your initial one? Because it's not just the first decision that matters, it's the follow through. When we ask for wisdom, that's great. That is step one, we should do that. But then God will give us that wisdom. He is a generous God. He's gonna do this without finding fault. But then the expectation, the response is, follow through. Make the decision right. And so for us, it's not just about, you know, 
choosing to ask God for wisdom. It's about committing to responding and following through in that wisdom that he gives us. So then, here's the other question. How does God give us wisdom? Well, he gives us wisdom through his Son and through his Spirit. God gives us wisdom through his Son and through his Spirit. And he illuminates that through his Spirit-filled word and through Spirit-filled people. But listen to these words that the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand a miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And a little bit later in, in the beginning of chapter two, he says, when I came to you brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and in fear with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise or persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest in men's wisdom, but in God's power. God gives us wisdom through his Son and through his Spirit. And sometimes that wisdom is not going to match the wisdom of this world. It's not going to look like the fires that we make for ourselves. It's not going to look like the taillights of the cars in front of us leading us on a path that we don't want to go. The wisdom of God looks like Jesus Christ. And the wisdom of God looks like the Spirit of God which comes and empowers us to know what to do to not only make the right decision, but to then follow through by making the decision right. This is God's gift to us, who is a generous God, who loves to give us his son and his spirit. And our role is just to ask. Listen, it's Christmas time. You're all here for your own reasons in this room. And so whether you've been coming for a long time or this is your first time, let us be intentional during this Christmas season to actively respond to the leading of God. Let us actively seek not just to make a right decision about, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow Jesus. Let's follow through and actually follow Jesus. Um, some of you here, maybe, you know, whether you're watching at home or maybe you're, you're sitting here in the, the chairs, maybe for you, you've never actually made a decision to invite Jesus into your life. Uh, if that's you, please hear this. Jesus Christ wants you. Jesus Christ wants you. This whole Christmas season, it, it's not about the music or the stuff we get or give. It's not about all of that stuff. It's about celebrating the good news that God came into the world as Jesus Christ who wants you. And God invites us to respond to that gift of Jesus and his life, his death, his resurrection by making the decision to follow him. That is the wise thing to do. And then for all of us here who maybe we've made a decision for Jesus at some point. Uh, for me, I remember when I was a, a little kid, I was like, six, seven years old, and there was some vacation Bible school that someone in the neighborhood had, and they talked about Jesus and said, oh, you can invite Jesus into your heart, and you'll go to heaven. I'm like, that sounds nice. <laughs> so, so I prayed a prayer, and, you know, as a little six, seven-year-old, that made sense. Um, but then, you know, I got a little older. I had some questions. I wasn't plugged into a church, and following Jesus was really not on the agenda for me. But when I went to college, I thought, man, I got to I should figure this out. Like, I call myself a Christian, but I don't know what that means. Maybe some of you can empathize with that. 
And so in my first year at college, I'm uh, trying to figure things out. I'm trying to figure out my classes, my studies, all this. And I'm, I'm sitting in a physics lab talking with uh, this guy who's my lab partner. And I was pledging a fraternity at the time. And I asked him, like, hey, are you pledging anywhere? And he says, nah, you know, I already tried pledging once, but I realized I couldn't because I was already pledged to someone else. What? What are you, like, married? He said, no, I, I'm pledged to Jesus Christ. No one talks like that. <laughs> you know, like, that, it was so surprising. And honestly, nine times out of ten, if someone had said that to me at that point in my life, I would have just gotten up and left. Like that. But at that moment, I think God was speaking to me. And I felt this urge, I should ask this guy if he goes to church or something. So I said, hey, do you go to church or something? And, and he mentions like, oh, you know, on uh, Thursday nights, there's like this uh, campus ministry group that meets like at this time in this place. And that was it, like very low pressure. So I write it down and I show up to this thing. And uh, I'm, I go and, you know, it's this big lecture hall and there's a bunch of people there. They're singing Christian songs and people are talking. And I look around, I'm like, oh, I, I recognize this guy. I worked in the dining hall. I'm like, oh, that guy from work, he goes there? Like, he's one of the cool guys. Like that. What's he doing here? And just other people I've noticed there, I'm like, okay, so for the first few months, I just sat in the back, just checking it out from a distance, figuring out, is this what I want to do? And a little later in that year, I found myself on one of the buses at Rutgers, and I'm just praying. And I thought, huh, like, I remember praying this prayer to ask Jesus into my heart as a kid, and I said, you know, God, I don't know if that counts. Um, if it did, then like, thank you. But if it didn't, then please come into my heart now. I, I want to welcome you in. But regardless of whether, you know, what I did as a kid mattered, at that moment, like literally and metaphorically, I was on the bus with Jesus. Yeah. I was committed to just following him wherever he wanted to take me. And for me, making a decision to follow Jesus looked like that. And then for the rest of my college experience, and honestly, for the rest of my life, that's been what it looks like. It's choosing to say, God, I want to follow you. And it's not just, oh, I, I made a decision one time and it was all done. This is a repeated, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow through on the decision to follow you. This Christmas season is a great time to come back to those initial decisions to say, I want to follow Jesus, and to say, yeah, I want to follow through on that decision to follow Jesus. Because there is a whole world out there that doesn't yet know that God loves them, that Jesus Christ wants them. We can be those messengers. So this Christmas season, I'm so happy to be a part of Park Church, to be a part of a group that wants to do this together. So let's make this our mission to help people know that they can follow Jesus and that we can follow Jesus together, that this is not just the right decision, but the decision that as a church, we can make right. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can follow you this morning and that we can do that because you first pursued us. Jesus, thank you for loving us and wanting us. Thank you for being the light to our path and the wisdom for our way. Thank you for the gift of your spirit who resides in us, illuminating what we should do empowering us to go out and do it, and giving us a community to do this together with. God, I pray for anyone here this morning who hasn't yet made a decision to follow you. Jesus, thank you that you are inviting them now to, to join together with you. And God, for all of us uh, who've made decisions to follow you, God, help us follow through on that. And thank you that you are with us every step of the way through the dark and in the light. So, Jesus, we commit ourselves to doing this now, to following you. In the name of your Son, Christ, amen.